Well, this morning I'm going to be sharing a message with you on the prayer of faith. I'm so passionate about prayer and uh, especially for a new covenant perspective. And I think it's one area that believers really do need to uh, renew their mind to. Because once you understand the, the what the new covenant is and the bounds within the new covenant and Jesus' finished work, the one thing that should dramatically change should be our prayer life. So here we go. This is the prayer of faith according to Mark 11 verses 22 to 24. This is what I was taught, that the prayer of faith is, was as a specific prayer model, a way to pray, to be able to move God or to see results in my life. So Mark 11, 22 to 24, this is Jesus. And Jesus answered and said to them, and he's speaking to his disciples, he says, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says therefore I say to you whatever things you ask when you pray believe that you receive them and you will have them okay so as you look at this in English how it's been translated in our English Bibles this is the New King James translations other translations are very similar that it looks on the surface as a bunch of stuff that we need to do that if we believe we don't doubt in our heart then then we can have whatever we say Okay, but also you've got to have faith in God. You've got to get that right. So I'm not going to go through what we've been taught. There's been so many different teachings, but we're going to break down this message today and look at it in uh, the context and just to see what Jesus is actually saying. And we're going to look in the Greek at what some of these Greek words mean. So then when you come to understand Jesus' point and his message, that you will be able to be transformed in your thinking and then you will start to see Jesus kingdom outworking in your life that is my heart prayer for you now context we don't have time to go through this today but if you read all of Mark 11 you'll see just prior to this Jesus uh, saw a fig tree he was hungry he went to eat uh, to go and get the fruit off the fig tree but and it was the season for figs but this tree had no fruit so Jesus simply said, may no one eat of you ever again, uh, cursing the fig tree, as the scripture says. And then on the next day, the disciples came back and they realized and they saw the actual fig tree that it had died, but it actually died at the root. You know, so the very life force of this tree had died. And so this is directly after that when they said, look, Look, Rabbi, look, teacher, the fig tree you cursed has withered. It's died from the root. And that's when Jesus responded and said to them, Have faith in God, for assuredly, I say, whoever says to this mountain. And another uh, one in uh, one of the other Gospels, it says, Not only can you say to the fig tree, but you can say to the mountain, Be removed. And that's where the discourse, that's the context of this discourse so just prior to that you'll see that there in verse 20 to 21 it says now in the morning as they passed by they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots and peter remembering that jesus had cursed it the day before remember said to him rabbi look the fig tree which you cursed has withered away so that's just a little bit of context and it will just help us as we go through today's message so that's the context there. Now, the other context, what we've got to remember, because we've been taught that this is a, a faith, or the prayer of faith, this is a model to, bright, to pray, to be, experience a breakthrough in our life, is the context here is Jesus is not talking about healing of sickness and disease. He's not talking about healing of infertility or any of those issues, reproductive issues. He's also not talking about deliverance or provision or... Uh, or anything else like that. That is not the context. But we've made this a, a prayer model to pray for those areas, okay? But Jesus had already, if you understand Scripture, and you understand where this is in Scripture, Jesus had already given his disciples power and authority to cast out all unclean spirits and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Okay, that was a little bit earlier on that Jesus had done that. So he'd already given them power and authority what, and what to take authority over demons and, and unclean spirits and authority over all sickness and disease. So when it comes to healing, deliverance, provision, healing of fertility issues, etc., is that this is not, Mark 11 is not the model to use. 
Jesus had already given the disciples um, power and authority. So the precedent in scripture for healing, and, and these are the scriptures that will share that, is in Matthew 10.1. And remember, that this is uh, in chapter 11 of Mark, Luke 9.1 and Luke 10.19. Okay, so that's, that's the... Um, the context but what you'll see with today's message and all these scriptures that i've shared there matthew 10 luke 9 and luke 10 is that they're all talking about uh, the power and authority that jesus had given to his believers and it's about his believers exercising their god-given authority that is how we see god's kingdom manifesting in our life and through our life it's not about going to god and asking him to do what he's already done it's not about praying a certain way having a certain amount of faith but it's about knowing what god's already done through his son and making use of that authority and appropriating what we've done uh, with our circumstances and you'll see that today as we conclude this message so very clearly, Mark 11 is not a method or a formula that we are meant to use. Because once again, this is what I was taught, that you must have faith when you pray, that you must believe in your heart. So you've got to have faith. You've got to believe. You can't have any doubt because if you have any doubt, you're not going to receive anything from God, from what the scripture in James says. Okay, and so we've got to understand the context of James. We won't have time to go through that today. And... Also, then uh, God will answer you. So if you get all these things right, you know, it's very similar to what I shared at the beginning, then God will answer. But this is not a method. This is not a prayer method or a formula that Jesus was giving us to see answers in our life to our prayers. Okay, it's about us exercising our God giving authority. You know, I was taught that our faith moves God, our prayer moves God. But when you look at the finished work and you understand the finished work of the cross, God has already moved. He moved over 2,000 years ago when he sent Jesus to come and redeem mankind from everything. He was the last Adam and he redeemed mankind from everything that first Adam brought upon us. So God has already moved. God has already responded. Jesus is God's yes answer to you. So that's why we need to understand who Jesus is, what he has done for us, and our position in his kingdom to understand how to transform and revolutionize our prayer life and our relationship with God. You know, I just really want to encourage you, if you struggle with faith, and if you struggle with doubt, unbelief, fear, worry, all those things, and worry if you aren't going to receive anything from God, I really want to encourage you to, to go back to basics and to really learn the simplicity of what faith is. Okay? Because otherwise, if you're struggling in your faith, it then puts the focus on you and your ability, and then you get it to work. You start working on yourself. You start trying to learn how to build your faith, how to pray properly, how to do this right, how to do that right. But then that's really you're getting to work. That's not about trusting and resting in Jesus. That's not a, that has nothing to do with you learning to hear from the Father, concentrating on your relationship and letting him guide and lead you in your journey. And that's really what you, you really want to, to be in that position. So any teaching... Any teaching that puts you in condemnation in your faith life or your prayer life is that we really need to put all this stuff to the shelf and really expose it for what it is, okay? And and don't get caught up in, in that trap of going onto in that treadmill, okay? So when it comes to prayer, when it comes to faith, there's no methods or formula. There's no methods or formulas to a breakthrough or to a relationship with God. It's a journey. It's not a destination. It is a journey. It's a lifestyle. And it's a journey that I, it's my prayer that you will enjoy as you get to know how much the Father loves you and as you get to know how to hear his voice and get to know how to be led, how to hear, to be led. So when he is communicating with you, when he's quickening a scripture to you or quickening something else to you or perhaps using someone else to share something something to bless you, you know, and to that you can identify that so that you can know that you're not on your own, that he is involved in your life, that he is on your side and he's wanting to help you through in your journey. Okay, we need to understand also that God is always ready, willing and able to show himself strong to us. Jesus lives in you. 
His very spirit lives in you. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. He cannot deny himself. You were sealed with a spirit of promise, you know, but because we've been taught all this oh, rubbish about our relationship with God is that we feel that God turns his back on us and he doesn't hear us. And, and again, that causes us to strive rather than knowing that, that sometimes that we get so guilt-ridden and we then become full of shame and guilt and condemnation that we're not listening to the Father's voice because we don't feel worthy to hear from him. But you, if you're a believer, you are worthy. What makes you worthy is faith in Jesus. Okay, so we've got to get past looking and self-analyzing and really start to analyze who Jesus is and our position in him as a believer. Okay, because that is, is what makes you worthy. Believing in Jesus is what makes you worthy. Believing in Jesus is God's yes answer to you. Okay. So let's go through this verse now on, on the prayer of faith. We're going to look at first verses 22 to 23. So look, just listen here, and I've bolded a couple of words. And really, I'm going to show you, this is not about asking and receiving. This is about laying hold of your authority. So Jesus answered and said to them, which was the disciples, as we know in the context, have faith in God. Okay, not have faith in yourself, not have faith in your own ability, but have faith in who? In God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says, he will have whatever he says. Okay. So three times he says, whoever says to the mountain and believes that those things he says will have whatever he says. So if you have faith, if you believe in God, you can you can say to a mountain. Okay, so can you see it's about what you say. So it's not about what you pray, it's about what you say. So it's not about what you pray as we've been taught to ask God to do something for us. It's about what we say is that is when we make use of what God's already done for us and we start to take authority over our own life and our own circumstances. Can you see that? So the prayer of faith is not about what you pray. It's about what you say. Because you have faith in Jesus, you can say to a mountain, you can say to sickness and disease, you can say to infertility, you can say to your financial dramas, you can speak to the storms in your life, you can command them to be still. Because you are a believer in Jesus, you have the same power and authority that Jesus has because his spirit lives in you. So believers, it is time that you open your mouth because the breakthrough is in your mouth. Okay, so it's not what you pray, it's about what you say. That's good news. Once again, this scripture, as you can see, it's not a model way to pray and ask God to do anything for you. It's about you as a believer in Jesus, making use of your God-given power and authority. You have access to everything of who Jesus is. It's not your power. It's not your authority. We know that. We're not ordering God around when we're taking authority. Why? Because God, what we do doesn't move God because God has already moved. We are making use of Jesus' power and Jesus' authority in our life. And I think it's really important that we more believers are taught this. If we were taught this and when we come into faith, I think that we would have so much less stress and drama in our life. So have faith in God. Jesus begins in verse 22. So let's look at this. So to have faith in God, so simple. It's to have faith in him and in his ability not in you and your ability, okay? For us, we're in your covenant. Uh, we are children of God. We put our faith in Jesus, okay? We can put faith in God through Jesus. The Father and Son are one. Don't get too hung up on that. But you have faith in God and in God's ability and not your own, okay? And when you really break this down and look at it, he's really saying have the God kind of faith. And to have the God kind of faith is to do what God would do and say what God would say, 
Okay, you know, we are believers in Jesus. We are joint heirs with Jesus. We are seated with him in heavenly places, Ephesians 2, 6 says to us. So when we, what we need to be doing is looking to Jesus. We are joint heirs with him. We are seated with him. So if you want to see God's kingdom advancing in your life, through your life, you want to see the power of Jesus healing your body, transforming your life, transforming other people's lives, then look to Jesus. Okay, look to who he is. Look to what he would do in that situation so rather than going to him and begging him to do what he's already done asking him to heal asking him to deliver asking him to provide instead look to what jesus has done through the finished work of the cross and do what he told you to do what he commanded you to do is he's given you his power and authority so go and make use of it and start taking authority over these areas in your life that is what it's like to have the God kind of faith. We would do what Jesus would do. We would say what Jesus would say. Jesus only ever did what he heard and, and saw from the Father. So through our relationship with him, because you're not on your own, he will guide and lead you in this journey as well. Because while we're um, the scriptures are similar, we're all equal in Christ. We have the same uh, power and ability. We have the same potential, every single one of us. Our, but what's different is that we are different. Our circumstances are different. Our upbringing's different in the kingdom. We've been taught certain things that we've got to unlearn, etc., etc. You know what we're facing, how we view our life. It's different. But Jesus is one and the same. Our potential in Him is one and the same. So that's why relationship is so important that He can guide and lead you in your life, in your circumstances, to show you personally what to do or not do, to do, what to say or not to say. So then that way that He is personally involved in your breakthrough. I mean, it's, it, it sounds so simple. There's a message also in my um, prayer series, this New Covenant prayer series, on uh, how to be led by the Spirit, how to hear from God and how to be led by the Spirit. And I just share some simple ways on how you can grow in this area. Okay, so once again, when it says here, have faith in God, we need to remind ourselves that our faith and our prayer and when we exercise our authority, we're not moving God because God has already moved. Okay, our faith in God positions us to experience what God has already done. Okay, so when we say yes to Jesus, we become part of God's kingdom. God's kingdom now dwells in us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And when we start exercising our authority, we're then exercising our kingdom power and authority. And that's how we start seeing the breakthrough in our life. So don't feel that you're ordering God around. That's not how this is at all. What we are doing, we're doing what God, um, what Jesus, in fact, commanded us to do, okay, is whoever says to the mountain, you know, be cast in the sea and you don't doubt but believe in your heart, we're going to look at that in a second, that you will have whatever you say, okay, it's about you exercising your authority, okay, it's time as believers that we make use of what we've already inherited, Okay, get past all the man-made stuff, get past all the formulas, stop worrying about our faith, stop worrying about how we pray and really go to the Father and because know that because we have faith in Jesus, we have everything we need for life, for godliness. We have already been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ so that we can now go and make use of what we've inherited and start seeing that kingdom outworking. It's good news. So this next part in this passage, so you have faith in God. So that's not about your ability. It's about you trusting and resting in God and his ability. For us, we're post-cross, so we are resting in Jesus and his finished work. But here, what about But if you don't doubt in your heart? So this is the real uh, kicker for a lot of people. Because we've been taught you can't doubt in, in not even a little bit, because then otherwise you voided this prayer. I was actually taught this, that if, if you have any inkling of doubt, you've just voided that prayer when you prayed. So that meant nothing. So you now have to start all over again. And so then I became so concerned and so condemned because I just was so worried about having doubts or not having doubts that I had doubts. And you get on this vicious cycle. But we're going to look at the context of doubting in your heart and what that's about today. I want to release you from the bondage of having doubt. 
Now, one thing I'm not covering unbelief today, but unbelief in context in scripture is not talking about your faith journey and about you trusting God for a breakthrough. Unbelief, the context of unbelief means you've turned your back on and you have rejected God. You've rejected Jesus as your savior. That's what the Israelites did through their hardened heart of unbelief. They turned away from God. They bowed down and served other gods. So in context, they're not believers. An unbeliever is a person who is unbelief. They don't believe in Jesus. Okay, that is the context of unbelief, not about what your ability to believe or not believe. Unbelief is speaking of an unbeliever is the context. So please, let's get rid of the bondage and the doubt you have of unbelief. Okay, it's not about your faith journey at all. So doubt, let's look at doubt now. So let's get rid of the any guilt, shame, condemnation. Stop worrying about if you doubt. And you know what? We all have doubts. And in fact, uh, I think in our faith journey as we're growing, it, it's it's not a bad thing. It's not a sin to have doubts, my friends. We all have doubts as we are learning and we are grow, growing. But you know what? Sometimes what you need to do if you're struggling with your doubts in your journey is go, you know what? Okay, I know that I'm doubting. I've got doubts here. I'm questioning things. But in spite of these doubts, in spite of these fears, I'm going to choose to rest in Jesus. I'm not going to look at those. I'm not going to focus on those. I'm going to focus on who Jesus is in my journey. I'm going to focus on who he is, what he has done for me, what I know, what the word says about who I am in him and who he is in me. And I'm, I'm just not going to be moved by my feelings and my emotions. Okay, we don't deny them. They're there. They're real. But in spite of them, we choose to go, right, I'm not going to live by them. I'm not going to come under bondage to them. I'm not going to be subject to them. So yeah, they're there. They're real. I'm human, but I'm going to rest in Jesus. I'm going to focus on him and, and grow in this journey. And then as you do that, as you get past the guilt and shame and condemnation you have over doubts, you'll find that you will grow in this area of learning how to rest and learning how to trust in Jesus, learning how to focus on Jesus. And the voices of doubt, they do begin to wane and eventually disappear. They'll never go. They're always there because we are human. We live in a fallen world. We're very sense orientated, but the more we learn to trust in Jesus, the more we learn to rest in him and to sense his peace, the easier it becomes in that journey. And once again, it's not a destination. Okay, it is a lifestyle. It is an ongoing journey where we're growing. And that's the exciting thing. You know, and it is exciting because next week you're not the same as this week. Next year, you're not the same as this year. The year after, you're not the same as this year. And sometimes we feel that we haven't changed and we haven't grown. And sometimes we grow so naturally within the kingdom. It's not until we face something that, that we would have struggled with before that we can actually look back and go, oh my goodness, I've changed, I've grown. You know, and that that's effortless. It really is. You find that it's effortless as you grow and you realize that sometimes it's not like a hallelujah chorus and a massive revelation and, you know, thunder and lightning and, and the rest is just you growing day by day by day in your journey. I just really can't stand anything that, that causes us to become legalistic, causes us to become self-righteous. Self-righteousness is a double-edged sword. It either makes you feel inferior to others or um, superior to others. Okay, so you either feel that you're better than everybody else by what you do, or you feel that you'd never measure up, that you're not good enough. And it's, but both is that double-edged sword of self-righteousness, as far as God's concerned, whatever you feel you can do by your own performance is like filthy rags. The only thing that pleases the Father is you putting your faith in Jesus, is you resting in Jesus. It is really that simple. So I really do need to understand the simplicity of what faith is and unlearn all the man-made stuff that keeps us in bondage and slavery and, le and caught up in legalism. Legalistic in our prayer life, legalistic in our word life, legalistic in our church life, legalistic in our giving life. You know, just learning how to, to be led by the Spirit and live by the Spirit. Letting the Holy Spirit lead us in all these areas. Because when the sun sets us free, we are free indeed. Okay. 
And even Paul said, if you're led in Galatians 5, he said, if you're led by the Spirit, then you're not um, in bondage to the law. You're, you're not subject to the law. And that is good news. So continuing on doubt. This word doubt in Greek, so in Thayer's lexicon, so in, in we know in the Old Testament it's written in Hebrew, New Testament it's Greek. We have Strong's uh, Concordance, which uh, will tell us the definitions. It's like a biblical um, dictionary concordance. will tell us the definitions of some of these words in Scripture. So Thayer's is um, for the New Testament with Greek, so it's just another concordance, but sometimes I find it gives a lot more detail. So Thayer's Greek lexicon says of this word doubt in this Scripture and elsewhere, it's Strong's number 1252, and it means literally to separate, make a, a distinction, or to discriminate. And that's different ways that it can be translated in English. Okay, Strong's exhaustive concordance says of this word, it can mean contend, discern, doubt as it's got here, judge, be partial. Okay, so the, the actual correct uh, translation should be from the Greek to English should be judge. Okay, so don't judge your heart. And there's a lot of English words that have been added into the scriptures to form sentences, which sometimes can change the um, the actual intent and the, the definition of really or the point that Jesus is making. Okay, so this word doubt, 1252, uh, it comes from two words, dia and krino. Okay, so it's diacrino, this word in Greek. So doubt in, in English is diacrino in Greek, but of two words of dia and krino. Okay, so it's their two words put together. So dia very simply means through. Strong's Concordance says that this dia, which is dia in uh, the correct um, phonetic pronunciation there, is can mean through, on account of, because of. So the word dia is where we get in the English word um, the term diameter. You know, if a cir circle cross, you know, the, the, from a diameter of a circle, it's through to the other side. Dia, so through. Very simply, what through means, and crino means judgment. Okay, health word study of this word crino means to separate, distinguish, so or to judge. Come to a choice or a decision or a judgment, because judgment can also mean a decision, my friends, by making a ju judgment or by making a decision, either positive, a verdict in favour of, or negative, which rejects or condemns. Okay, so Crino, when you see the word judge, where I'm actually going to do a series on judgment. I'm going to go through New Covenant judgment and how if you're a believer in Christ, you will never come under judgment. And I'm going to prove that through the scriptures to you. And uh, there's three different, three main words that we see just simply in English, judge or judgment. But there's three Greek definitions, decision or verdict, consequences, or I've forgotten the third one, Crino, Crisis and um, Krima, three different definitions. So we'll go through that in a later series. But Krino means judgment. So doubt basically means to judge. Don't judge in your heart. But in Greek, it means through judgment, diakrino. Okay, so don't judge through judge. Don't judge your heart is what Jesus is saying here. This is the correct definition here. So don't Judge, don't look at your own heart, okay? So you're not looking at the negative or even the positive. So you're not looking at if I have faith or if I don't have faith. You're not looking at whether we just saw that that through judgment means it, that you're making a judgment, you're making a decision based on a, in a positive or negative verdict. We saw that whether you're even whether you're innocent or whether you're guilty. So Jesus is saying, don't judge yourself. Don't judge your heart. Don't judge your behavior, either positive or negative. Don't judge your prayer life. Don't judge your faith life, positive or negative. Okay, in verdict of, favor of, or against. Stop judging your heart. Stop judging your faith, my friends. Okay, didn't Jesus say, you know, he said, while well, he said, don't doubt, doubt in your heart, he just said, have faith in God is the context. That's how he started this. He says, have faith in God. Okay, for assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, and if you, you know, you believe and you don't doubt in your heart, so stop judging your heart, stop you putting your faith in God, you stop judging your own faith ability, he's saying. It's not about your faith, it's not about your prayer life, it's not about your ability, but it's about you having faith in God. Okay, so stop doubting, it means to stop judging 
yourself, stop self-analyzing yourself on your innocence or guilt in any area, on your performance, positive or negative in any area. Keep your faith in God. For us, New Covenant, we keep our faith in Jesus because the only thing that pleases God is faith in his Son. So this is why we need to stop judging our faith level. Stop judging whether we feel we're in faith or not in faith. You know, sometimes what we've been taught about faith, we feel that we're in faith. You go, I'm in faith, I'm believing, I'm doing all this. And really what that is, is just a positive affirmation. Okay, because faith just means that we're trusting in Jesus' performance. Because if you're trust, trusting in your own performance, and I've been there, where I've gone, I'm in faith, I'm believing, I'm declaring, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm fasting, I'm giving, I'm serving, I have faith. My faith was based on my own ability. I was judging my heart and my faith level by what I did. I was bypassing Jesus and me trusting in him and who he is and what he's already done for me. Can you see there the difference? There's, so sometimes the word of faith ministry, while I love it, it's great, a lot of it puts the emphasis on us and what we can do. And that's why we need to just identify what's scriptural, what's man-made, so we can go back to the simplicity of, of what simple and how simple faith is, and that's by putting our faith in Jesus. Very simple. And when you look at the word faith, pistis, it just means to have, but you're persuaded. You're fully persuaded. Okay, you have confidence in. But again, it's not in your own ability, but you, you're fully persuaded. You have confidence in who Jesus is and his ability, which is looking at the finished work and what he's already freely done for you. Okay, already covered that. So faith is about resting in Jesus' ability and not your own. That is the simplicity of faith, my friends. So I hope that you can get past any guilt or shame or condemnation about doubts. Doubt just means, you know, stop judging yourself. Stop analyzing yourself. Stop focusing on what you believe or don't believe. Just look to Jesus. Focus on what he's done for you. Renew your mind to that. Meditate on that. Focus on that. Grow in that. And you won't worry with doubt soon if you keep doing that because you will grow in this area verse 24 then jesus says therefore i say to you whatever things you ask when you pray believe that you receive them and you will have them now see here the words i've um, un underlined here them and you will have them i've underlined them and put them in italics because in the new king james they are in italics and if you look at the little footnote, it will tell you that these words have been added in by the translators. In fact, there's been a whole lot of words that have been added by the translators. So the only words that you will see in the Greek, or if we take all the added words out, or inserted words, to, which the translators did to try and form a sentence to make it a little bit more coherent, but what it does is changed pretty much the definition. But when you look at it in the Greek, you, you can go to Bible... Um, biblehub.com go to um, strong's numbers and you've got the new american standard um, concordance there you'll see all the different words that have been added in and it's so the only words that are there in the original is just very simply therefore i say jesus therefore say whatever you ask pray believe receive so the only words you'll see there where with jesus um uh, putting something on us for something for us to do is whatever ask pray, believe, receive. So we're going to look at these words in Greek and in their context to see what Jesus is actually saying to us. And you realize it's been really unfortunate that the, the, the translators added in certain words and really have changed the definition because that's why there's so many different methods and formulas and teachings on this one simple verse. So we're going to be looking at these words, ask, pray, believe, and receive. So ask, Strong's Concordance. So this word ask in Greek, Strong's number 154, is ahteo. And we've got in English ask, and it can also be translated as request. But the definition is I ask, request, petition, or demand. Okay, and it comes under a Strong's number 4441. Which and that says of this word ateo, it is this word ateo to ask. The definition it is strictly a demand for something due. Doesn't that change things? 
What we've been taught about ask is we're making a request. We're seeking, inquiring of God, asking him to do something for us. But the actual Greek word means where it's a demand for something due. Remember what I've shared on our authority? We're not demanding God do anything. We're not what we do doesn't move God because God's already moved when he sent forth Jesus. What we're doing is we're making use of what God's already freely provided for us. So ask is simply a demand, strictly a demand for something due. Now, my formatting has gone out here, but the, the TDNT, which stands for the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, and also DBL, which stands for the Dictionary of Biblical Languages, they both say of this word ask, Strong's number 154 of Ateo, means to request, to speak, to say, to utter, call, command, or demand. That's what this word ask means. Now, pray. This word pray so in English, it says now when you pray, but when you look at the Greek, there's only one word there, as I've said, is pray. And as we go through this New Covenant prayer series, by the end of the series, you will know what the word pray, when we see the word pray in English, praise, prayed, praying, what that means. And this word pray that we have in English, in Greek, is pro acumai. Okay, pro acumai comes from two Greek words, pro and acumai. So pro in uh, helps word studies of that's Greek Strong's number 4314, properly motion towards, to interface with, literally moving toward a goal or destination. When we're praying to the Father, he's the destination, okay? Towards with, this word means, indicates extension towards a goal with implied interaction or recipro reciprocity with presumed contact and reaction. Okay, love, love, love this word. Naturally suggests the cycle of initiation and response. Okay, so as we go towards God for contact and reaction, initiation and response. Okay, that's pro, but we, you're going to learn prayer isn't us going to God and God hearing and responding to us. Prayer is um, us going to God and we're interacting with him, we're hearing and then responding to him, okay, as he leads us. So Akumai helps word studies, 2172, Strong's num, num, um, number, means properly to wish, offer a request. And uh, helps word studies then continues on this word and uh, of pro Akumai together. So that's, so pro means towards, with, contact and reaction. This, and it naturally suggests the cycle of initiation and response. Akumai means properly to wish, offer a request. And just in English, it's got pray or wish for. But when you join it together and we start looking at beyond the man-made stuff and look at the Greek definition and within its context of the new covenant, that pro acumai means towards an exchange, properly to exchange wishes. So pray literally to interact with the Lord by switching human wishes, ideas for his wishes as he imparts faith. Faith is a divine persuasion, but faith is not about you building your faith for a particular outcome. It's about having faith in Jesus and who he is. He will persuade you to believe in him. Okay, you'll be fully persuaded as he continues to reveal himself to you. Okay, and then it says, accordingly, praying pro cumai is closely interconnected with the word pistis, which is faith, which means to be fully persuaded, have confidence in. Now, we're not going to go through this word today on faith, but faith, simply pistis means to have confidence and to put your faith in someone, not yourself. So it's not about your own ability. But when you look at Helps Word Studies, what it says about faith, it says it's not generated. Faith is not generated through human merit or effort. Okay? You cannot work up faith. Faith is a gift of God, not of works, so that no man can boast. God gives us the faith that we need because he has set eternity in the heart of every man. So God has gifted us with everything we need to be able to freely respond to to the invitation to receive Jesus and eternal life. And I love that when you look at that. God has done everything for us. He's even given us the faith we needed to respond to his love, to respond to salvation. You know, the only thing we need to do is to respond, and that's by our heart response. God cannot force that. He won't force that. 
in 1 Corinthians 13 where it talks about love, which is the nature of the Father. It says, God will not force his own will or way upon you because God is love. Love cannot do that. God cannot force his will or way upon you. But he's given you and gifted you with everything that you need to be able to respond to him. Okay. Unbelief is to harden your heart and reject him. Okay, so it doesn't refer to you if you're a believer, but a believer has already responded to him. You re reciprocated to what he has done. So pray. That's, that's simply what faith is. But pray, it's very similar. He's talking about your relationship with God towards an exchange. But once again, prayer under the new covenant is not about you going to God and God hearing and then responding to you. Prayer is about you going to God and then you hearing him and then responding to him as he leads you. So the exchange is uh, that God revealing to you by his spirit the things of Jesus. I share that within how to hear the Holy Spirit or how to be led by the Holy Spirit, the message at the end of the New Covenant prayer series. But that's what the Christian life is all about. That's consistent with what Jesus said about the role of the Spirit. He's going to take from what is mine. He's going to make it known to you. He's going to warn you of things to come. He's a spirit of truth. He's going to guide you into all truth. Okay, and everything of who I am from the Father, the Spirit's going to take and reveal and make it known to you. He's going to guide you and lead lead you uh, in your life amen that is good news amen meaning so be it okay so that's prayer and uh, d doubt pray now believe this word believe so strong's concordance means pistio pistio to believe to entrust so to believe and not doubt in your heart so believe means have faith in and have trust in Else word studies, oh, this word pistio comes from pistis, from faith. So derived from a word which means persuade, to be persuaded, to believe, affirm, have confidence. Okay, now there is a human believing. So, and that human believing that it says here, it's not about you building your faith and trying to build it in the way of, by what you do, but it's by renewing your mind and reminding yourself of who Jesus is and what he has done. So faith, uh, pistis, it comes from the Father. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that no man can bo uh, boast. So faith, it says here that um, of pistio, what Strong's number 4100, is, uh, it says here, is self-serving without sacred meaning. Or the believing that leads to it proceeds from God's inbirthing of faith. So God gives you the faith, and then as you renew your mind, of who Jesus is and what he has done for you. That's uh, the point of where you're reminding yourself of who Jesus is, is what it means to believe. Okay, so it's not like what we've been taught about your ability and you strengthening that faith and building your faith, but what you do and what you pray and what you say and what you this and what you that. Okay, it's not about that. It's about you focusing on Jesus, looking to what he has done for you, looking to who he is, and learning to be led by him in your journey. Now, Thayer's Greek lexicon says that this word, believe, to think, to be true, to be persuaded of, to credit, place confidence in. Okay, so it's putting your faith or confidence in something. And once again, it's not in you or your ability, your faith ability or your prayer ability. Remember the whole point of this passage, Jesus began with have faith in God, believe in God, put your confidence, put your con your trust in God. Okay, not don't doubt in your heart. Don't judge your heart and your own ability, he says. Okay, you're believing in the Father, you're trusting in the Father. For us, we're resting in and trusting in Jesus and his finished work. So that is believe. And then now receive. So we've done pray, ask, believe, and now receive. Receive. It actually means, um, it, or in English it says believe that you receive. In English it just says receive. Strong's Concordance, to, Strong's number 2983. In Greek this is the word lambano. And you've probably heard me mention this a few times. And I think I will always mention this word because we do need to unlearn the English definition of what we understand receive to mean. We need to look at it in the biblical context and the Greek definition to understand what Jesus is saying. So this word receive is a verb. 
and it, can, and it means I receive, I get, I take, I lay hold of. This is what lambano means. I, I get, I take, I lay hold of. They as Greek lexicon says of this word uh, uh, lambano, to take with the hand, lay hold of any person or thing, what for? In order to use it. To take in order to carry away, to claim, to procure for oneself of that which, has, which when taken is not let go. It's the equivalent to seize, lay hold of or to apprehend. You're laying hold of, you're taking, procuring something to yourself. You're, this is what the word receive means. Also means to take by craft like you can have our catch used of hunters or fishermen. They're catching, they're laying hold of something. And or it means to take to oneself, lay hold upon, take possession of, to appropriate to oneself. This is what receive means, my friends. So it doesn't mean that we're asking when it asks, pray, believe, receive. It's not we're asking God to do something for us because God's already moved. He's already done something for us. Pray, procure is we're not asking God to, um, he's not hearing and responding to us. We're hearing and responding to him. Believing is about keeping your faith and trust and focus on him and not yourself. And receive means you lay, you taking, you're laying hold of something. Okay, so to receive doesn't mean you have your hands open going, Father, I want to receive something for, from you. So we're opening our hands and like somehow God's going to give us something because when you understand that finished work, you will know what God has already given to you. You'll know that what you have already received through Jesus' finished work. You will know your inheritance, who you are in God's kingdom, your position, your power and authority, who he, Jesus is in you, you know, your potential in him. You know the power and authority that you have, everything of the kingdom through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So you've already received uh, under the new covenant you've already got the kingdom living and dwelling in you the same power that rose jesus from the dead lives and dwells in you jesus we've already covered this has given you his power and authority to cast out all unclean spirits and to heal all manner of sickness all manner of disease you can do what jesus did you can say what jesus said because you have the very same spirit of jesus now living and dwelling in you so to receive is to lay hold of what Jesus has done, to take in order to use it, to apprehend it, to appropriate it to yourself. Can you see that? How received we've got to unlearn what we've been taught and not look through an English Western mindset in my case, but to look at it as a Greek and a biblical mindset and look at it in its original context. This is good news, isn't it? And also, uh, the, the missed one point here of this word receive under Thayer's Greek lexicon, the final thing that th this word lambano means to take, to admit, receive, to receive what is offered, not to refuse or reject it. Lay hold of it. Take it. Make use of it. Okay, that's what the Father wants you to do. That's what Jesus wants all his believers to do. And what is that? Is to respond to what God has already given to you. Respond to what God has already done. Okay, once again, I want to spell this out. At some point, we understand that God has already moved. He's already provided when he sent forth Jesus. So we're not asking God to move, to provide, to heal or anything else. Okay, under the new covenant, we are making use of. We need to learn to lumbano, receive, lumbano, make use of, appropriate what God has already done for us. Okay, we are post-cross. Always remind yourself of the new covenant position. We're not the disciples. We're not Abraham and Sarah. We're not walking towards the cross and what Jesus is going to do. We're walking from Jesus' finished work. So what God has provided for in his word is not a future tense promise when it comes to what Jesus has done. It's a past tense provision. So believers, that's why it's so important we learn how to receive biblically, how to lumbano biblically, how to make use of what God has done for us biblically. Good news. 
And as you can see, it's about exercising your God-given authority. It's laying hold of your position in the kingdom. It's exercising your power and authority of what God has given you through Jesus. That you can do what Jesus would do. You will say what Jesus would say. And I hope that this is going to bring all this together here because it's so incredibly powerful. Okay, so once again, Lumbano, we need to learn to Lumbano. We need to learn to biblically or scripturally receive. We need to learn to lay hold of, to get, to take uh, take hold of, appropriate, apprehend in order to make use of what Jesus has already done for us. Okay, and that's by exercising our authority. Now, I have a message on this, on how to exercise authority over your circumstances that I think you'll find at the end of the New Covenant Prayer Series. So you, I go into a little bit more detail on this, on the practicals of how to exercise your authority. But just for time, and we're just going to stick to this simple passage here. Okay, so bringing this all, all together, to ask means to say, to speak, to, to command or to demand, to pray is, we're talking about a, an exchange, okay, from God, he, you know, not God hearing and responding to us, but us going to God and us hearing and then responding to how God has led us to ask, to which is to say, to command or demand. So really pray, we go to God to hear how to take authority over our circumstances and believe is to be persuaded and have confidence and to continue to rest in Jesus' finished work. Remember, we're not doubting in our hearts, so we're not judging and, and analyzing ourselves. We keep focusing on Jesus. So we ask, that's what pray and believe and receive means to go, go get it, go take it, go lay hold of it. Amen. That is so exciting. Therefore... Ask, pray, believe, and receive when we understand the Greek, what Jesus is saying, whatever you command or demand through hearing, through your relationship with the Father, through that exchange from hearing God and then responding, be persuaded, have confidence, and then go take it and go and lay hold of it. It's so good, isn't it? Now, this is not about name it and claim it. But it's about hearing and responding to how God has led you. You're taking authority over your natural circumstances. This is also has nothing to do with stepping out in faith uh, like Peter walking on water. Uh, okay, but again, it's about because um, what happened with Peter, Peter heard and respond. He saw Jesus on the water and he said, if that is you, Lord, command me to come. And Jesus said, come. So Paul was, uh, sorry, Peter wasn't just blindly stepping out going, well, I want this and I want that and I'm just going to magically step and walk on water. What Peter did, he stepped out on and he responded to Jesus' command, which was come. That was a rhema revealed word to Peter at that time and he did it. He was empowered to do it as he was led by Jesus in that instance. So it's not about him making a decision of name it and claim it and I'll just step out and I'll just start a new business I'll just go into debt and believe God's going to pay it off I'm just going to do x y and z that doesn't work it's all about relationship hearing you know pray and praying is the key and that's going to God and hearing and responding to him let him quicken something to you let him guide you and lead you and reveal Jesus to you about your power and authority so you can go and command and demand that situation to be removed to command that sickness and disease to be removed in your body to to keep your focus on Jesus and then go and lay hold of that breakthrough Okay, that is so powerful and it's so simple. And when you understand this truth, it does revolutionize the way you pray, the way you relate with God. And really, when you understand that finished work, there's less praying for stuff and about stuff and more time when you left just learning to, to rest in God's presence, to learn how to hear his voice, to really get to know him for who he, who he is and not trying to manipulate or, or to try and get something from him it really does transform your christian life and journey so i pray that this message has blessed you and just on closing and i do go through this in more detail in prayer and jesus finished work is faith the prayer of faith has got nothing about you building your faith but you're responding to what god has already done okay so faith rests in jesus ability not your own 
Faith is not about moving God. Faith doesn't move God. Prayer doesn't move God. Why? Because God already moved. He's already done everything for you. Jesus is God's yes answer to you. So we need to understand these points. Uh, Faith and prayer is also not about asking God to do what he's already done. Example, healing, healing of infertility, healing of finances or anything else in your life. It's about Uh, partaking in what God has already done, partaking in the healing that God has already provided. Remember, ask means to command or demand. It's time we take, make use of our authority in Jesus. The other thing, faith is not about, when I say rest in God, it's not about relying on God's sovereignty and making God to make the decision for us. God's already made the decision. Jesus is God's yes answer. God's already responded. It is already there, freely available to us. So remember, rest doesn't mean inactivity. Rest, and when I talk about resting in Jesus and Jesus' finished work, it's resting. It's it's So it's ceasing from your own laboring and striving is what I'm saying when I say rest. Stop trying to make it happen by what you do. Instead, rest in who Jesus is, but it doesn't mean do nothing. Okay, so it's not... Um, It's not about your activity, so it doesn't mean no activity, but it's about spirit-led activity where the Holy Spirit will then reveal Jesus' finished work to you and guide and lead you in your journey. Okay, always remember when it comes to faith, the way you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, saving faith is the way. It's how we came into the kingdom. It's how we access the kingdom. It's how we continue to live in the kingdom. We don't trust in our own performance and what we can do, but we rest in Jesus' performance and what he's already freely provided for us. Okay, so I hope this has helped you in your journey to understand the prayer of faith is not going to God and asking God to do anything for you, but because you have faith in Jesus, you can lay hold of everything that is already freely provided for you. Okay, so you can ask, which means because uh, you believe in Jesus, you can go and uh, exercise your God-given authority to command or demand that sickness, disease, or whatever it is to be removed in your life. You know, you, when you pray you go to God and let him guide and lead you in this area so you're not just doing it by rote or by what I've shown you as that he will lead and guide you personally and uh, believe just remember it's not about your faith but reminding yourself about faith in Jesus okay so don't judge your heart stop being introspective but or um, uh, focus internally but focus on who Jesus is and what he has done for you and then my friends go receive go and learn how, what it means to biblically receive to go and make use of lay hold of who Jesus is and what is already freely done for you so I pray that this will help you in your journey and beyond amen amen